You're listening to XVGM Radio. Welcome to XVGM Radio, where the bits keep coming. I'm Justin. And I'm Mike. And this is episode 14, My Picks. That's right. <laughs> We're doing an episode all about Mr. Justin today. Yeah, this is going to be a little different. I apologize if I offend people with my musical sensibilities, but uh, <laughs> that's what you get. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, a lot of people already know me. Mm-hmm. A lot of people who are coming here who have never heard us before... I'm sure at some point in time I'll do, like, my own episode, but... Oh, yeah. We need to. (laughs) Yeah, but for those of you who are joining us from Pixel Tunes Radio, my previous podcast, you know, you guys already kind of know who I am. Um, I've done my own episode on on Mike's picks before, but today we're going to be kind of delving into Justin, because, (laughs) you know, we've never really talked about Justin and his musical stuff and also his <laughs> background and knowledge. You know, we've got a little blurb up on our website at xvgmradio.com, but, you know, this is this is a chance for everyone to, you know, settle up by the cozy warm fire and get to know Justin. So oh. we'll be asking him a bunch of questions today. Yeah, this episode's coming out in December too, right? Yeah. Yeah, so get by that fire. Yeah. Stay warm. We That's heard it's right. going to be a bitter winter. That's right. We did hear that. But yeah, so I, I figured I'd take people through sort of my, my video game slash video game music history uh, a little bit, just so that folks know more or less where I'm coming from. Right, right, um, yeah. I, I do know that sometimes I have fairly esoteric picks. Uh, <laughs> it's like, it's either the weird stuff or the techno stuff. <laughs> that's true, that's true. How did? What was your first video game that you ever played? Uh, that's, that's hard to say, um, only because... I had video. I had access to video games at a very early age, okay. and I, I don't really remember the er, like. My earliest memory of playing a video game is on like the the song that we just heard came off in television, and okay. that was the first system. Uh, it was owned by my father. Uh, in fact, we might as well talk about it now because sure. maybe this was my first game, Burger <laughs> Time, on the Intellivision. Came right. out in nineteen eighty two. Uh, the track that we heard coming in was called In Game Two, uh, and it was composed by Bill Goodrich. Right. Just a classic track. I mean, I, I personally have fond memories of playing this on, I think, either Nintendo or Atari. Yeah, this was actually. on, like, everything. Yeah. Arcade, Intellivision, Atari, yeah. no. Coleco, mm-hmm. everything. I didn't know that, for, like, the longest time, I didn't know that you could, like, move along one of the items, like the patties or the, the buns or yeah. the ketchup or, or not ketchup, the lettuce. Yeah. The all tomatoes. that, the tomatoes, all that stuff. Did you say the toothpaste? No, the tomato. Oh, please. I thought you said toothpaste. <laughs> you know, that toothpaste yeah, burger. Yeah, the toothpaste burger. You never had a toothpaste burger? Come on, Every Justin. Day. Yeah. So I didn't realize that, you know, as a kid, that you could move along most of it and then you could wait for the enemies to appear oh, from yeah. the opposite side. And when they walk on the patty that you're on, you just walk to the opposite side and you're like, sucker. And yeah. then the patty just Dro- drops, drops with them. Yeah. With them. And it, basically, that's the <laughs> easiest way to play the game. So I used to play the game on like super hard difficulty <laughs> mode because I never did that. So Yeah, yeah. No, it, it took me a long time to figure that out as well. Mm. But I, I have. I have some fond memories of this game. Yeah. Um, as, as we were sort of discussing before we started recording, this track is very short. Yes. And it's 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 a very short loop. Yeah. Um, and despite that, I find it to be very iconic. And I, I really enjoy it. And I enjoyed listening to it again. Mm-hmm. But I also remember, you know, listening to the song over and over <laughs> for like 30 minutes straight. And eventually it'll definitely, especially if you're not doing well, this this will this will take you down. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> This is what you listen to when you die. Yo, uh, <laughs> every one of my tracks, apparently. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's so. This is this is sort of like my humble beginnings. Uh, you know, I grew up in the early '80s with an television. We had, you know, Burger Time and Frogger and mm-hmm. Pitfall and all those all those fun games. So, how old were you then? Ooh. When at that point? Because I mean, like, I didn't play my first video game until I was probably five. Yeah, five or six. Uh I would say probably. I mean. You don't. You generally don't remember things mm. pa- earlier than like three years old. So yeah. uh, I'll say maybe like four or five. Okay. Okay. Uh, and when did the NES come out? That was that was eighty five. Yeah. So yeah. I mean that 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 I would have been two at that time. Okay. But yeah, we we didn't get an NES for for another couple of years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's been a bunch of versions of Burger Time like <laughs> after this. 
some weird versions and the arcade version and like you know all different kinds of versions of this game but uh this you know a serious thing to reboot yeah that'd be kind of <laughs> cool actually i think they did reboot it fairly recently really? the wii u or the WiiWare or huh. something like that because i remember watching a review of somebody talking about a new burger time game and that's it was funny. just kind of meh oh, that's so unfortunate. yeah well i mean you know it's it's a pretty it's, simple game. Yeah, it's a pretty simple game. It's it's more about repetitiveness and score yeah. too. It's it's all oh, about score. Yeah, like those old get like Donkey Kong. Yep. Yeah. So this composer, Bill Goodrich. Yes. So Bill has a very limited career, and I'm not quite sure why, but he started in 1982 with Tron Deadly Discs, okay. another classic. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I'll just read his whole his whole uh, set of credits. He's got uh, he did Space Spartans in 1982 as well as Lock and Chase in 1982, mm. Burger Time in 1982, and then. His last game was Buzz Bombers in 1983. Okay, okay. So pretty much just like of the arcade era, yeah, you know? Yeah, yep. So we're going to move into something that is a little bit more complex, right? Oh, yeah, a bit more complex. <laughs> I, I have a lot to say about this next track. Ooh. Um, yeah, so uh, like I said, eventually we got an NES when I was maybe like six or seven. And this was one, this is not one of the first games that I had on it, but this is actually one of the last games I ever got for the NES, mm. uh, but I fell in love with it. So this is Final Fantasy, came out in 1987, and this is the opening theme by Nobuo Uramatsu. <laughs> Welcome back. That was the opening theme of Final Fantasy. It came out in the NES in 1987 and was composed by the famousest Nobuo Uematsu. <laughs> the famousest. <laughs> he is the famousest. Yes. So this is your favorite composer, right? That's a good question. Like video game um, music composer. Yeah. I don't want to say yes only because I feel like 
he's everybody's favorite. No, I wouldn't say but, that. Yeah, I mean, anybody's into Final Fantasy. But, sure. But uh, yeah, he, he's, he's definitely one of my favorite. I don't know if I can pick a favorite at this point. No. Due to you and, you know, other friends that I have and other podcasts that I listen to, particularly mm. Pixel Tunes, mm. um, I've gotten a lot more into other composers. Like, sure. it used to be that I would only really listen to stuff like Final Fantasy. Like, I was that, right. kind, that kind of stereotypical Final Fantasy nerd. Right, right. Um, and I branched out here and there, but for the most part, I always went back to Final Fantasy. Mm. And uh, but because of other things, like, there are there are other composers that are really good that I'm like, oh, I really like them. So, mm-hmm. like, I don't know how I could compare, like, Nobuo to somebody like Tim Fallon. Right, right, right. I mean, his stuff is totally different. Totally different. Also totally awesome. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, definitely one of, one of my favorites, though. That's That's one of the really cool things about doing a podcast is uh, with video game music mm-hmm. is that you get to explore video game music in its entirety you get to open yourself up to new worlds one of the things that i, I really loved about pixel tunes was um when i was working with ed i was able to learn so much about like shooters shmups you know the more obscure like japanese computer systems like the pc 98 the oh, pc 88 yeah, yeah. you know we did a lot of stuff with that sharp x68000 so a lot of that i really grew to appreciate and i would say that podcast completely changed my mind on (laughs) fm synth and the genesis and everything i liked the genesis musics prior to that but i love the genesis music now like it really grew on me so since you're kind of not so big of a fan of the genesis we need to we need to sit down and and showcase some some mighty awesome tunes. I've actually been really thinking about doing like a Genesis <laughs> oh, episode. Yeah, yeah. You, we, we were talking with a friend about doing something yep. or like get, getting together and doing like a Genesis weekend yeah. uh, sometime coming up. And I'm yeah. I'm totally down for that. Like, yeah. I, I I apologize to any Genesis fans out there. <laughs> I, I talk a big game, but in in reality, I there, there, I mean you'll find out in this episode there yeah. there are Genesis songs that I like, and I I'm also well aware that the Genesis can sound good. Oh yeah, but at, just at, in the right hands. It, that, that's exactly my my yeah. point. And like. There are so many games in the Genesis, mm-hmm. and a lot of them just, I don't think the music sounds great. Yeah. I'm learning a lot about what what your interests are and, and some of the music that you listen to, and I can kind of say, like, oh, okay, so he's really into, like, this kind of style or that kind of <laughs> style. So, but with this track in particular, it has a very, like, I don't want to say militant, but it has a very, like, church-like Yeah, well, there's, I mean, you can definitely process to this song. <laughs> um... I'll get to that in a second. But yeah, no, it, this that's that's a big part of this song. Yeah, um, it's it's one of the other things that I like about the song is just like the cadence to it. Mm. Um, I mean, this is one of the faster versions. It's the, right. the first version, but it's also I guess you'd call it a staple. Yeah, like it, this song is in every Final Fantasy. True, um, and it's funny because generally when when folks or at least when I used to think of Final Fantasy, I would think of what's actually, it's called the prelude. Yeah, yeah. So and like that's a lot of people think of that for, oh, with Final Fantasy but yeah. this song I mean here it's called opening theme and a lot of the later games it's called theme of Final Fantasy oh okay um, interesting so it's, it's in every game I didn't know that as a kid I used to call it the castle theme mm. it's, it's the theme that played in the castles my experience with Final Fantasy is very limited I'll be honest mm. uh, I've played five seven I've played a little bit of six I played eight up until that yeah <laughs> We won't, we, won't even, we'll get into that. we won't even get into that because I'll just rage and quit. <laughs> I'll just rage quit. And then I've played a good chunk of 10, hmm. and I started 13, and I hated it. So Thir- 13 is not very well liked, and no. actually I, I have not played 13. I, I own yeah. it, but I, I just haven't gotten to it. Yeah, I like a lot of the weird like side games, like like the Dissidia, Chocobo Racing, Chocobo yeah, Racing yeah. the Dissidia series, like the fighting game series, the Final Fantasy um, Theater Rhythm. Yo, yes, call. I love those games. Yeah, yeah. So that it's 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 weird. Like I, I really love seven. <laughs> and then anything else other than seven, I'm like, yeah, that's a pretty good game. But like this <laughs> first game, I really haven't played. I know it exists, I know it's a great game, but it's I've hard. never played it. Yeah. It's also a very basic game for the Final Fantasy games, right? Like Yeah, oh I mean it was plot wise at least. It, it it was a very basic plot. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's not as basic as like, I don't even know what to compare it to. Like it's it's not super super basic, but sure. compared to it's not like Mario basic, you know. No, no, it's not Mario. Yeah, exactly. But like compared to like Final Fantasy X, right. with like the whole Fey and the dream and all all this Ugh. other crazy stuff, and or like eight with 
time travel and weird things. Like it's 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 a very basic plot of you start off not knowing anything about like your party has amnesia, classic D and D. Um, you don't know how you met up, but you all have these like sh- these orbs that don't shine, mm. and then you come across this village, rather a castle where the princess has been kidnapped by some guy and taken up north and you mm. run around you go fight him you get her back and then it starts playing this song uh. and, and it almost does a credit scene I was like that was super quick and then it turns <laughs> out that now, now now the map opens up to the rest of the continent ah uh, okay, uh, and, it, okay. And, it, and it kind of builds on itself oh that's interesting I did not know that. Yeah, no, it 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 sucked me in with it with its weird like its weird opening story, and I was mm. just like, really, this is this is the end, and then, oh no, it's not the end, and then it just got bigger, and there were pirates, and mm. there were elves, and there were you know elemental disasters. Mm. Uh, it, it's the scope of it is large. It had a huge map. Yeah, yeah. It's it's really funny though. Like I I didn't play the first Final Fantasy <laughs> on the NES at all. I didn't play the second. I didn't play the third. I didn't play the fourth. Well, the I didn't. The third you wouldn't have been able to play until well, yeah. Times anyway. But, but I, I I didn't start. Final Fantasy until seven. seven. That was my yeah. very first Final Fantasy. I but it's a great one to start on. Um, I actually played Dragon Quest before I played. Ooh. I played the very first Dragon Warrior. Dragon game. Warrior, yeah, right, yeah. right. That was my first experience to RPGs, hmm. just because they were handing them out with Nintendo Power subscriptions. So. Ah, yeah, that, that was another good one. Um, yeah. I, I didn't like that one as much as Final Fantasy. I found it to be a little bit more complicated. Yeah, it's also a little bit more bland in terms of the fact that you only are playing as one person, and I like the oh, idea right. of playing yep. as multiple characters. Yep. So so you mentioned process. Pro- process. Pro- process. process. What, t- so, t- fill me in here. So uh, you may remember uh, about a year and a half ago from when we were recording this, uh, I got married. Yay! And <laughs> so for... For the ceremony, I arranged um, all the music for uh, for a string quartet to play, uh, and this song is actually the song that I arranged for my wife Ariel to come down the uh, to process down the aisle to. That's really cool. Yeah, that's super cool. I mean, yeah, that's really cool. <laughs> I mean, the fact that you were able to do that first is kind of mind blowing, but also the fact that like that was music that you made like basically you handed them the sheet music and you were like here you go and yep. they were like okay cool exactly. and then they did it <laughs> yeah. so that's super cool all we did on my wedding was we paid a DJ to play <laughs> video game music during the but cocktail that, hour but that was awesome like that was cocktail hour so my cocktail hour was uh, was that same string quartet mm-hmm. but they were playing string quartet versions of like modern music like right. um, radioactive and stuff like that right right but like but that, that was sort of like the whole the, the whole deal was like I wanted to get the string quartet uh, and I wanted to write music for them. Yeah, yeah. And and like writing music itself is a huge monumental task that yeah. I didn't think that I was up for. You started like way early. I uh, remember. I started I think shortly after we got engaged. Yeah, so yeah. Almost uh, almost a year before we got married. Jeez. Yeah. Because it was just like like writing your own music is is, is really difficult. And I, yeah. I knew that I didn't uh, that I wasn't up to that task. Mm-hmm. But I also knew that like I wanted. Like this song specifically, since uh, I decided when I was a child that yes, maybe someday I want to get married. Like that was the song that I wanted my wife to That's walk down the aisle cool. to. That's super cool. Yeah, and uh, I was very happy to be able to do that. Cool. That's awesome. Yes. Let's move into a song and a game that I am very familiar with, <laughs> and you also happen to be as well. What do you got for us? Yes. So next up, we are going to hear from Mega Man 3, which came out in the NES in 1990. The track is called Gemini Man, and it was composed by Harumi Fujita and Yasuaki Fujita. Thank you. 
welcome back. That was my favorite game of all time, Mega Man 3 on the NES that came out in 1990. The track was Gemini Man, and that was by Harumi Fujita and Yasuaki Fujita, the husband-wife Capcom composing team. Power couple. <laughs> AKA Bun Bun is yes. uh, one of their names. So Love this game. Love, love this track. Some, love me some Bun Bun. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, hey, they did... They did fantastic stuff. Oh, yeah. Um, the, the, the entire soundtrack to Mega Man 3, as far as I'm concerned, was phenomenal. So two episodes ago, we talked about these guys quite a bit. Harumi Fujita and Yasuaki Fujita, the composers of this track. <laughs> so Harumi Fujita did... I'm just going to pick three random games. Strider in 1989 was the music composer on it. Punky Skunk in 1996. <laughs> always Punky Always Skunk. Punky Skunk. And Hell Knight in 1998. Yeah, and Yasuaki Fujita, I'll, I'll do the same, just uh, pick three at random, or maybe not so random, uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit 1991, uh, they, did, they did sound design on. On uh, the Game Boy game, yes. which is what we talked about during that uh, episode with Rhythm and Pixels. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, they're also listed as music composer for Breath of Fire 1993, really good game, really good series. And uh, we will come back around to sound composer in Panic in Nakayoshi World in 1994. Yes. I have no idea what that is. I guess it's some sort of an arcade game. But they also worked on Mega Man 4. Yes. Yeah. It's... What is your... Ex- I gotta find out. <laughs> what is your experience with Mega Man 3? It was one of the games that I played almost nonstop as, really? uh, as, as a kid. Yeah. Hmm. I, I think Final Fantasy 1 and Mega Man 3 are probably the two NES games that I played the most of. Really? Huh. Um, yeah, Mega Man 3 was... Uh, it was the first game that I ever used a first game, game that I ever Genie? used a game Genie on. Oh, okay. um, Because I couldn't beat it and I and I wanted to. And then, <laughs> and then I learned how to beat it without cheating. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it was it was definitely worth it. Huh. What, were you cheating like Extra Lives or something? I don't remember. Probably Extra Lives. Uh, I remember playing around with some of like, the Moon Jump. And oh, the, right. The, the, I, like to, I like to play around with some of the crazier things just mm. to see what, uh, what what it would do to the game. Right, um, right. Usually like the Extra Lives so I at least get to the end or mm-hmm. like, I might start with a power stuff like that it's funny you you arguably picked my least favorite track on the soundtrack really yeah uh yeah I, th- this track in particular um th- there's a couple reasons that, that, that i picked this one yeah. I mean, for one obviously i, I like do, i do like it it's one of my favorite songs on the track uh, on, on the game for the record it's a great song yeah. it's just Not my least favorite yeah. of the soundtrack and, right? and out of a soundtrack that's stellar mm. like the, le- the the there, there has to be one at the bottom right sure so. sure one of the other reasons that I like this track is it's Gemini Man and my birthday makes me a Gemini. Ah, okay, okay. <laughs> and then on top of that, uh, when I started getting into OC Remix stuff in, what, late middle school or early, no, high school. Mm. Uh, so when I started getting into OC Remix uh, stuff in high school, there is a remix of this song that's called, I think, Gemini Salsa. Uh-huh. And it is one of my favorite Mega Man remixes. Awesome. Um, it, it takes that sort of like that back melody mm-hmm. um, and turns it into a salsa beat. Oh. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> well, I mean, it is a very like samba esque yes. salsa kind of track, so that totally makes sense. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> How did you hear about this game? Did you like? Oh, that's that I don't actually know. No, because um, it might have been a Nintendo Power, but it, I don't think it was the Nintendo Power that was the Mega Man Three Nintendo Power. Mm. I think it was one where they were they, where they were talking about it. Okay. I wasn't part of the Nintendo Fan Club or whatever it was that mm. got you those magazines, but every so often. Uh, if I was good enough, I could convince my parents to buy me one. <laughs> it, I do have a lot of friends that are huge into Mega Man um, yeah. these days. Obviously, I'm friends with you. Yeah. <laughs> but I, a lot of my friends are really big into Mega Man. But I didn't make, like, Mega Man club friends, whatever you want to call sure. them. Sure. I didn't really make friends that were big into Mega Man until probably <laughs> early high school. Mega Man club friends. <laughs> yeah. I just, I think of two things. <laughs> one is it's a, it's a club for Mega Man fans. And two is... It's a group of people who really like sandwiches, and they make sandwiches based off of Mega, <laughs> Mega Man bosses. Man. It's a Mega Man club. Yeah. Triple Decker. So like, uh, you know, Shadow Man. <laughs> Shadow Man would definitely have pepperoni oh, on, yeah. on his. Definitely. Because he slices it with the blade. Top Man marinara. Yeah. There you go. Okay. Snake Man. What would Snake Man be? Snake meat? Oh. <laughs> I, I guess. I guess. That's cool. Uh, yeah. It's interesting that Gemini man, because you know you're you're a Gemini, right? So now I just need a Pisces man. Yeah, I'm surprised you know? that they, they never went. They tried to do any full of the on other. Zodiac. Yeah, Zodiac man. Ooh. 
That'd be pretty cool. Mega Man 12. Come yeah, on. that's right. Zodiac Man. Do it up, Capcom. <laughs> so, yeah, no, this is a great track. I love the the song. It, it's, it is one of my least favorites. This and Needle Man are like my two least favorites. Mm. But you know, they've really both grown on me over the years, and I've come to appreciate them more. <laughs> Whenever I played through the level, I always tried to get through it as fast as possible. So, so I didn't have to it. listen to the music. <laughs> Yeah, I think, if, if I remember correctly, I think Gemini Man was actually one of my least favorite stages. Is that, that's it's a pain. The bubbles, right? yeah, yeah, it's a pain to get through. It takes forever because you got to get through all those fish babies. Yeah. I don't know. Oh, yeah, those things yeah. too. Yeah. But I did like Gemini Man because he was one of the easier bosses. All you had to do is just yeah. keep jumping over him. <laughs> that's true. I actually had a lot of trouble with him when I was young. Mm. But, you know, then you get good. Yeah, exactly. You know, so. Get good, son. You get good. So it looks like Janine's saying we got a call on the line. Oh. I thought this was supposed to be all about me, but mm. we should go ahead and take it. All right, well, caller, you're on the air with XVGM Radio. Who are we speaking to? And what can we do for you? Uh, d- this is Justin's mom. Uh, hi. Uh, hi. Uh, can, can you do me a favor, Justin? Uh, ma, ma, mom, wh- why why are you calling while I'm trying to record? Some, somebody get her off the line. Well, um, I, I need you to I need you to call your father and um, let let him know that that the chicken is no good. Uh, oh, oh okay. What I. I, I, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna let this go and um, that actually reminds me can, can we can we hang okay thank thanks um, so that, chickens no good Justin no it's not no but on that note yeah this is something that I heard constantly when I was playing the <laughs> you, next game you heard the that chickens I, no good that yes. you're just mom just constantly saying while you're playing the upcoming game that we're about to talk about it's, hey the chicken's no good it's cla- constantly interrupting me and I always had to pause this game and that's yeah. how I learned some of the uh, some of the secrets to it ah. but um yes yeah, so, <laughs> this next game is Gradius 3 one of my favorite <laughs> games of all time okay uh, on the SNES it came out in 1990 and the track is called Easter Stone and it has a couple composers here Kazuki Miraoka Kazuhiko Urehara Harumi Ueko and Yuki Morimoto. Cool, let's listen.
welcome back. That was Easter Stone on Gradius 3. It came out the SNES in 1990. Composed by Kazuki Muraoka, Kazuhiko Urahara, Harumi Ueko, and Yuki Morimoto. Gradius 3 is a game that I believe I did play when I was younger. Yeah, but I know you. This is like one of your jams. Yeah, yeah, I, and I mean it's <laughs> funny because I'm not like I'm not super great at it. I don't have any speed runs, mm. and I'm not like I, I can't get through the entire game without dying. But yeah. it's it's a lot of fun. Yeah. I I was never big into shmups. I did play the original Gradius on the on the NES. Mm -hmm. I miss Gradius too, although I have gone back more recently for it. Um, but that came out on Famicom, I think, exclusively, right? So that's why I missed it. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so then the this was, you know, one of the games that I got for my birthday one year on the uh, on the SNES and it was just like I was surprised to uh, to to enjoy it as much as I did cuz like I played R type and, and like the other games that are very similar. Yeah. And it's just I don't know. I, they they just didn't feel the same. Yeah, I didn't like R type as much as I liked Gradius. And I think part of the reason for that is I th I like the soundtrack a lot more on Gradius. Mm. I, I think that you know the the Konami fan in me yeah, oh, really yeah, really yeah, yeah. appreciated the the Gradius music, but yeah, no, it's it, I mean it's it's classic. Too. I'm terrible at Gradius. <laughs> I've always been terrible at Gradius. I like the games, mm. but you know I I would get to a certain point and would just get fed up because once you die in this game. That, that you're just so defeated. Yeah. Because you're so powerful. Generally, yeah. Like if, yeah. Especially if you get very far. Like right. Like the, 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 I think this is level four, three or four. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it, it's called Easter Stone because uh, it's, it's the level with all the Easter Island heads. Right. The, uh, the Konami's Moai. weird, weird obsessions with Moai statues. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, like you get that far and you have three or four options rotating around your whichever version you've got you've mm -hmm. got one you know either the the, the double gun or the or the laser baseball uh, bat yeah the <laughs> hamster in the wheel basically everything yeah uh, and the kitchen sink yeah absolutely uh, and then you know you, literally kitchen sinks just, just like rotating around rotating you. around you it's yeah. a shield yeah but then you run Tomo ahead, and uh, all of a sudden you're back. At, you're back at the beginning of the level Square with square one. Yeah, no. So if you had any power ups that, that you hadn't spent, you, you start with one power up uh, point that you could use in a speed up or something. Right, right. But you've got you know nothing else. Mm -hmm. It's just like uh, you're so criminally slow in this game oh, too, without any too. speed power ups. Like you need at least two. Yeah, at least two to play the game. <laughs> like just to play the yes. game. <laughs> if you go, if you go over, I think four. Then it becomes uh, then it becomes unplayable again mm -hmm. though, because you just you can't control. Oh, it absolutely! Really. Yeah, there's a certain balance to the speed <laughs> in this game. It's, it's actually one of the things that I liked about Gradius Three is you could customize your bar on the bottom, mm -hmm. and one of the options is oh, was a speed down option. So if you if you took too many speed ah. ups, you, you, I mean you have to build all the way to the end of the bar. Sure. Then say speed down. Mm -hmm. like, I'm going way too fast. <laughs> that now this game came out. I think it was close to a launch title, if not a launch title. 1990, yeah. Yeah, for the Super NES. But I think it might have also come out on an arcade as well, which I would imagine the arcade plays much smoother. Um, oh, yeah. This this game is plagued with slowdown. It's it's actually one of the uh, now that you mention it, that's actually one of the reasons that I like this game so much. Mm -hmm. It was. Not quite a bullet hell. In yeah. some in some cases, it, it felt like one, but is this? I believe this is pre bullet hell days. Yeah, it, it um, was. This is a more traditional shooter. Yeah, but it, it got to the point where there was so much stuff on screen that it's like if it if it were going at normal speed, there's no way my brain, even as a child, <laughs> yeah. would have been able to keep up with it. But yeah. because the SNES had these limitations, it's yeah. like everything just slowed to a crawl, and I was like, yeah, I can navigate through these four enemies and get to the other side, mm -hmm. yeah, and, and not die. <laughs> That's a good point. When I was a kid and I would play games like on the NES or Super NES specifically, because the Genesis never really had too many problems with slowdown. The Super NES and NES were plagued with slowdown in, in a <laughs> lot of ways, and I, and I think part of that was just because they really pushed the limits and the boundaries of the chip for what it could do, and there were only oh, yeah, a certain yeah. amount of sprites and, and that could be on the screen at the same time. Yeah. And in my mind, as a kid at least, I thought that this was an intentional effect. <laughs> Meaning I thought oh. that they were trying to make it cooler by, like, perfect example, Gemini Man from yep. Mega Man 3, when you're shooting at him, when he starts doing, like, the jumping, mm -hmm. the... It, it's like starts getting slower, and same thing with Needle Man. Yeah, oh yeah. Like when you're fighting Needle Man, when that laser is going all over the place, <laughs> you're super, super slow. And I always thought that that was part of the 
game. Like it was intentionally like put in there. Like yeah, we're gonna make it seem like time is slowing down. Like, yeah, like oh, it was a Flash Man. Yeah, 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 where, yeah, yeah. Where that was intentional. Right, right, right. <laughs> I found it to be charming because it allowed me to, to do well in a game that yeah. I otherwise wouldn't. No, that's able very to. true. That's very true. I, I would <sighs> definitely take advantage of of that. My least favorite part of this game by far is is I would probably say I think this level. This is the oh, one yeah. where you've got to blast through. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the rotating mo- uh, thing with like five, four, four Moai heads. Yeah. You, have, you have to blast each head in yeah. order to open the space. Oh, man. And they spit these rings at you. So difficult. The, this, this definitely was one of, the, one of the more difficult stages. Yeah. <laughs> I'm having flashbacks. <laughs> Gradius. Sorry. It's like Vietnam flashbacks, but Gradius. Gra- <laughs> Gradius flashbacks. Gradium. Yeah. <laughs> the track itself, though, is kind of ominous yes you know it starts out feeling to me sort of epic like yeah. it, almost like it's building to this this epic thing mm. and i mean this isn't the last stage of the game so True. it's definitely not quite that mm. and then as you listen to it more it doesn't really ever hit that epic uh, that, that epic thing that it, it seems like preparing you for mm. but that's where it turns like like you said it, it feels kind of dark yeah no definitely very ominous very evil <laughs> sounding and very like brooding I would say. Yeah, it's all those all those faces. The yeah. Mo- Moai faces. The Moai faces. They're judging you silently. <laughs> they are. Maybe not so silently. They're, they open their mouths and spit flashing rings at you. Yeah, yeah. The flashing rings is the judgment. Yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so Kazuki Muroaka worked on a lot of production stuff later on in his career with Metal Gear Solid. Oh, yeah. Producing a lot of the Metal Gear Solid games. Portable Ops was the first one that he worked on, I guess. Also worked on, I'll just pick a couple random games, Zone of the Enders, the second runner he did sound editing on. Uh, sound supervising on Beat Mania GB Gotcha Mix 2 in 2000. And also did a lot of sound programming and a lot of sound advisory and directing. Kazuhiko Uihara also did a lot of like sound producing later in his career. Did sound effects in Vampire Killer in 1986, which is the first game that he worked on. Mm-hmm. And then Nemesis 2, which I believe is actually Gradius. I don't know if it's Gradius 2 or Gradius 1 just repurposed for the MSX. But Nemesis 2 is a game that he worked on. Tiny Toon Adventures, Buster Bust Loose. Oh, yes. I think you mentioned (laughs) that. He busted loose. He did. He did on that. (laughs) TMNT Tournament Fighters in 93. He was sound producer on. And uh, let's go one more. uh, Sound design on Sparkster in 1994. He's done a ton and ton and ton of stuff with Konami. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of these guys are like career Konami composers. Stalwarts. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, Harumi Ueko uh, is another one of them. Uh, started out with music composition on SD Snatcher in 1990 mm-hmm. uh, and then moved into a number of games that we should be familiar with. You mentioned um, Tournament Fighters. They did uh, Turtles in Time in 1992. Yes. Uh, another one of my sort of favorite SNES games, Batman Returns in 1993. That's they did game. sound on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Castlevania Dracula X in 1995 so did the, sound design. So a butchered port of Rondo of Blood yes. basically. Yes. Yeah. And then Greatest 4 Fukatsu 1999. Mm. Uh, Jurassic Park 3 in 2001, and the last bit I have here is Beatmania IIDX15 DJ Troopers in 2008. DJ Trooper, all right then. DJ Troopers, they're like the um, they're like VR Troopers. That's the one I was thinking of. <laughs> yes. All right, let's move into a song. It's a classic. <laughs> what do you got for us? So, uh, as I said, there are some Genesis songs that I enjoy. So this is from Sonic the Hedgehog on the Genesis 1991. This is the Marble Zone theme by Masato Nakamura.
Welcome back to XVGM Radio, and this was Justin's pick for Sonic the Hedgehog on the Sega Genesis in 1991. This was Marble Zone, and it's by Masato Nakamura. So, Sonic. 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 <laughs> really? Sonic? Yeah, so funny Fill enough. Fill me in, yeah. I, I'm not a, not a big fan overall of the Sonic series. I enjoy watching people play them, mm. uh, particularly when those people are good at playing them. Mm. You wouldn't want to watch me then. <laughs> 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 I'm terrible at uh, Sonic. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to watch myself play, is what I'm saying. Because so. I always try to get everything. That's that's my downfall. I play Sonic like because, Mario. Because we, I was going to say, that's exactly. We, we come from the, the world of Nintendo. Right. Um, and like I had a couple of friends who had a Genesis, and at one point, one of my cousins had a Genesis. But uh, she was a bit older than me, and yeah. uh, so we, we didn't get to, to do much with it at the time because she was in that phase of like, oh, you guys are younger. and, and Ew, boys yeah. who are older, gross, yeah, or younger, younger yeah. gross. But, go put makeup on. Basically. <laughs> our, I've watched our friend Eric play through um, most of the Sonic games. Yeah. That's really all you can do when when, when Eric, Eric grabs a Sonic game is yeah. just watch him play them. Right, pretty much. Because um, you'll play. And then he'll just get frustrated because yeah, like, you're sucking. <laughs> yeah. My thing is, and it's funny because we both have a mutual friend in Eric. That's actually how we met. Yeah. Is through Eric. So what's really funny is the fact that you could watch him play the game and he'll just be like taking a specific route. And I'm like, yeah, but you missed all that stuff down at the other. <laughs> he's, and he's like, like he's like, don't worry about it. And I'm like, no, I have to worry about it. You didn't collect every ring, Eric. <laughs> So yeah. that's that's kind of my it, my qualm. It blew my mind when he explained how you're supposed to play the play, play this game because nobody ever explained it to me. Mm. Um, but just the fact that you're supposed to like go as fast as possible and, mm-hmm. fi- and find the quickest route, and I was mm-hmm. like, but but what about all of the the like the the stuff, the, the stuff and, yeah. and like the secrets? And yeah, it's like yeah. the secrets don't matter. Just yeah. get to the end of the level. Right. Have fifty rings. <laughs> jump through a thing. Like okay, mind blown. Right. Yeah. But so, yeah. did you have a Genesis growing no, up? No, no. Okay. I, I had an NES and SNES, yep. and then went to PlayStation. Yeah, same here. Um, and then I had a, a, a Macintosh computer for all my gaming needs. Okay, okay. Um, <laughs> Weird. People will laugh at that. I was gonna say Mac. Yeah, yeah. You and everybody else can shut the hell up. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm not. I'm just as a. I, I know you're a fan of of PC gaming. I, I am now. So um, a Mac gamer I, I, is I grew up on Apples and Macs. Okay. And there was the 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 thing about the Mac gaming community is uh, there was one, and you just had to know what you were doing. It sure. wasn't like a PC where you, where you could go out and just buy any games. Right. Um, but we'll we'll talk about that yeah, when, yeah, when, yeah. when we get to them. It's, right. it's, a, it's a whole whole whole, it's a whole topic. thing. Yeah. Yeah. But Sonic the Hedgehog. Um, mm-hmm. Wasn't very good at the game. I was able to get to the Marble Zone. I think that was the second world. To be yes. fair. Yeah, it is. Um, but this song, I just, I've always like, I've always loved the song. Yeah, it, yeah. There's so much going on there. There, there's, uh, I mean, the the melody itself is really catchy, and then all of the little flourishes they made my child mind and adult mind very happy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember seeing Sonic at friends' houses yep. or going somewhere and seeing Sonic and always be, you know, turning up my nose as a Nintendo <laughs> fanboy. But, um, you know, when I actually got a Genesis and I got the game, like, I actually sat down and played it and thought it was great. Yeah, no, it, yeah. it's fun for the most part. My, my problem is as soon as as soon as soon I start not doing well, I stop having fun. Mm. Um, because with, with Sonic, I feel like a lot of the Sonic games are very... I don't want to say they're brutal because they're not really brutal, but they're they're not very forgiving, mm. um, like like some of the other games that I'm used to. And when you start sucking, the game doesn't care. It's just if you if you start sucking, you're, <laughs> you you just give the control to Eric and right. watch him. Play. Right. <laughs> <laughs> pretty yeah. much, pretty much. Masato Nakamura mostly did Sonic stuff. Yes, and yes. if I recall, his music is licensed. For I believe the first two games, because he was the sound producer, music producer yeah, yeah. on those first two games, and his music is licensed by him, meaning he created the music and he owns the rights to the music. Mm-hmm. So anytime you hear any of this music, it's because Sega paid him money to huh. feature it. So like it's featured in Sonic Mania. Yep, yep. They had to pay Nakamura in order for the music to be used. Wow, I did yeah. not know that. Yeah. Um, one. Other odd, interesting tidbit about him is he did sound direction for World of Final Fantasy in 2016. Oh, really? Um, yeah. So bringing you know two of two things that I enjoy in some yeah. way uh, together. I mean, it's not Sonic music in Final Fantasy. But sure. He uh, he did some of the sound direction, so that's 
really cool. But yeah, literally everything else on here is Sonic the Hedgehog, Sonic uh, Hedgehog 2, Mario and Sonic at the Olympics. Right. <laughs> yeah, which is just basically the Sonic original music. Right, right. Yeah, and yeah, same yeah. thing with Super Smash Brothers Brawl yep, and yep. Wii U and all that. It's the same, same Sonic music. Right, right, right. Yeah. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, I did not know he uh, he was the owner and licenser of his music. That's yes. really cool. Yeah, Good for him. he is a bassist for a Japanese rock band called Dreams Come True. <laughs> so, just a little side note That's about really Nakamura. Cool. Yeah. So, moving out of the 8 and 16 bit era into a totally different realm. Yep. Where so, are we going now? So, now we're going into the realm of computer gaming. So, I mentioned I was a Mac user. This is one of the games that was not hard to find for Mac. This is Mist, which came out on the Mac and PC in 1993. The track is called. Channelwood Age Cirrus theme, or sometimes the other way around, Cirrus's theme, Channelwood Age, and was composed by Robin Miller. Do you love losing yourself in a good book? Well, now you can do both. Hi, Darren Mill here from Cyan Worlds, a new and exciting travel agency located in New Mexico. We're using newly discovered ancient technologies to take people to vast, never-before-seen vacation spots. And best of all, they're barely inhabited. Whether you prefer a spooky spire to explore or just want somewhere to kick back and relax in a village in the trees, we can get you anywhere from Amateria to Teledon to Channelwood. Just come in, take a book off our shelf, touch the linking panel and fall into a vacation. From there, it's up to you how long you stay and how you make it back. Come on down today and find your getaway for only $724, located just outside the cleft. Offer only valid in New Mexico. Return home not guaranteed. Uninhabited ages also not guaranteed. Bring your own notebook for solving puzzles. Residents of Utah not welcome. You're listening to XVGM Radio. Welcome back, dear listener. That was Mist, which came out on the Mac and the PC in 1993. The track is titled Channelwood Age Cirrus Theme and was composed by Robin Miller. Did you have any experience with this game? None. None? Okay. None. I didn't get a PC until I was in, I want to say, eighth grade. Oh, wow. So at that point, the N64 had been out, f or it was coming out? I think it was coming out. Yeah. Like that following year. And so I really wanted the N64, but I also really wanted... A computer. Right, so my right. parents were like, you have a choice. You can get a computer or you can get an N64. And and so I was like, well, I'll just get a computer. I happened to grow up in a household where we always had a computer. And That's it was cool. usually my dad's computer because my mother was technophobic. So it was always my dad's computer. Like we grew up, I, I grew up with like an Apple IIe and mm. then like a Mac Plus. Oh, wow. Um, and then, you know, it, it went up and up from there. Mm. And it, it was always like, I'd have to ask you to use a computer. Mm -hmm. You get like half an hour or an hour or whatever. I don't remember what it was as a kid, but yeah. it was always... It felt like enough. Like when I, by the time they kicked me off the computer, I was like, "All right, I'll do something else." Right, right, right. Yeah, that was back in the day when, you know, because we were of that generation 
the Oregon Trail generation, I guess yeah. you could say, where you still came from a world where it wasn't completely digitized. You know, we, they call it having an analog childhood and having a oh. digital yeah, teenage years. Yeah, that's fair. Because you know, g- growing up, it, it, everything for the most part was analog. Like, yeah. Most of my memories were playing outside. Like, yeah. I, there, were, there were video games, uh, but it was usually if it was crappy out, if you mm-hmm. couldn't go outside. You get to play video games. Yep. And, but even then, like, it felt like a treat, but it was never like I wasn't always trying to go back to video games. That wasn't until, like, later in life when I was yeah. a teenager and you were rebellious teenager, do what I want. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. Huh. But th- this game was one of the first, like, puzzle games that I ever really, really got into because there's a lot of puzzle games out there and they tend to be boring. And you could definitely make the argument that Mist is boring. There, <laughs> There is no dialogue or there's no real other character interaction. Mm. And then that's sort of what this, like one of the reasons that I chose this track is this track feels very sort of empty and lonely. It's very minimalist. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, you've got like, it's good for puzzles though. Yo, yeah. Well, yeah. And, that, and that's one of the things that, that made this game so great yeah. is the puzzles were hard, but not too difficult. And the music, the music was very appropriate. Yeah. And I really enjoyed that. Any, anybody who happened to catch my, my extra life stream um, back in November, this, this is what I was playing. I started with Mist, mm-hmm. um, and I, I, I blew through it. I say blew through it in, in about three hours. That's not a record by any means. Sure, music. sure. But, for, but still impressive. Like, I wouldn't be able to play it in three hours. Right, know? right. Like, I, I knew where most... like. Everything, for the most part, came back to me. And there was a few hmm. parts where I was just like, oh, I have to figure this out. But for the most part, like, I, I blew through that game. Okay. <laughs> Mist, to me, looking back, I remember hearing about the game. But looking back on it, to me, it was always, like, the nerd game. I know that sounds really bad because no, we're fair. all nerds. But, like, <laughs> that was, like, coming from a console-only perspective, mm. I was like, oh, Mist. Oh, you're going to go play Mist, huh? You're so fancy. <laughs> Do you need a cup of tea? With well, that game of mist, well, you know? I th- and and I I totally understand that. And I think where that comes from is we come from the, the world of eight and sixteen bit gaming. Sure. And this game was fully. Th- I mean, it, it wasn't like live action or anything, but it, it was really beautiful three D graphics mm. on every screen. And then on top of that, all of the characters that were in there, like when when you were talking to somebody th- through a book, or when you at the end go to go to talk to Atrus. It was live action recording, superimposed, and re- for the time, super well superimposed mm, mm. on those three D backgrounds. So it's like we come from these like these two D things, and the, the the coolest thing that we had that was three D was probably Star Fox, right? Right. To, the, to this this game where like there's people in it and they're talking to you, and yeah. like yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, I mean <laughs> yeah, ninety three. I mean it was right around the boom of the full motion video craze, yep. where every game had to have some sort of full motion <laughs> video, like. Um, you know, Wing Commander or yep. Night Trap and, you know, Double Switch and all yep, those yep. types of uh, adventure point-and-click games that all had some sort of full-motion video mm. feature. So, to talk about Robin Miller, the, the game was developed by a pair of brothers, Rand Miller and Robin Miller. Okay. Uh, Rand did all of the story stuff, Robin did the, the music. Mm. So Robin is really mostly attached to uh, to Mist and Broderbund. Mm. So Mist in 1993 did the music to Riven, the sequel to Mist. Mist Masterpiece Edition, Real Mist. Basically only did the music on the original Mist games, which was Mist and Riven. Mist 3, Mist 4, and Mist 5 were actually like they they were brought in for it, but they weren't the producers, I guess. Okay. Like they they did Mist and Riven all on their own, hmm. um, and then it looks to be they also did Real Mist and hmm. the the re releases. Right, right. Well, it looks like we are getting a call in, according to our producer Janine. So we may as well take that. Hey, you're on the air with XVGM Radio. What can we play for you? What was that? Uh, that sounds like an orc. What? You... Uh, speak orc? Yes, I do. Wow, what perfect timing. Almost as if this was written. <clears throat> Zug Zug. Uh, he wants to hear something from the Warcraft games. That's easy enough, because I love that series too. Thanks for the request, orc dude. Golkosh. Uh, so we will play. The track is titled Orc 2 from Warcraft 2. Came out on the PC in 1994 and the Mac in 1995 and was composed by Glenn Stafford.
welcome back. That was Warcraft 2 on the PC and Mac, which came out in 94 and 95, respectively. That was Orc Battle 2, and that was by Glenn Stafford. Yes, it was. All I can think of is bomb, 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 bomb. Yeah, this is, is a fun song. It certainly I... sounds like orcs going off to battle. Yeah, yeah, that is what I generally play it as. I mean, when you play through the game mm. uh, of Warcraft, any of the Warcraft games, you end up playing both sides because there's, there's a story for, for each side. Was it humans and orcs? Yeah, mm. orcs versus humans, I mm. think, was the original Orcs versus humans. Okay. The significance of this game to me has to do with the online capabilities. It was one of the first online games that I ever played. Sure. Uh, you know, AOL, CompuServe, and Prodigy were all a thing back uh, back around this time. I think mm. having you know a, like a modem in my computer and stuff. Uh, th this was before the days of Battle.net or any sure. of, any of that other stuff, or where you can go online to the server and find people. Mm -hmm. Call your friend up, like, hey, do you want to play? Okay, I'm gonna go online, dial me, and then you know you'd connect the the, the machines. Right. And on top of that. This was one of the cases where like, I was a Mac user and mo all of my friends were PC users, mm. and this was cross-platform. It didn't matter what they were on. Right, right. Uh, I, I could play against them. Huh. That's cool. I did that a little bit with Doom. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Me and my buddy Joe would, would do deathmatching. <laughs> it was always super slow. Yeah, well. Because we did modems, you know. We had 28.8 modems or 14.4 or whatever it was. <laughs> whatever the heck was 56K out. was, I think, the last, the, the I, highest rated thing they ever did. I remember when 56K came out and it was, like, mind-blowing that the internet was that fast. <laughs> we were like, it's so fast. Uh, I, I, my, my main memory of, of anything like that was when uh, DSL uh, came out. When, when I first got DSL. Oh, yeah. Uh, it was so stupid because I had... I had gotten to play with DSL at one of my friends' houses because mm. they, they, they got it early. Uh, and I was like, wow, this is so crazy, this is so fast. And then when we got it, um, my mother was actually out of town for for the week. And it, it came in, uh, like, we, it got installed on a Wednesday. And mm. I was just like, I guess who's not going to school? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was, what a time, what a time. Guess who's eating Twix and binging on JPEG porn. <laughs> oh, I was going to say Bark's root beer, but uh, okay. Listen. Twix is the only adult viewing snack. <laughs> uh, it's like, which one are you going to go with? The left one? The right one? Nobody knows. Oh, that's... All right, we're going to move this conversation along. <laughs> <right now. laughs> so, I have no experience with Warcraft 2, period. No? So, zero. The, the only one I've ever played is World of Warcraft. Oh wow! I always played as the Horde. So of course, when World of Warcraft came out, like I didn't even look at the alliance; I just went straight for the troll. Went, okay. I went to the Horde. Okay. Um, but I had a I had a similar experience as, as you did with uh, the getting lost in a game with EverQuest, mm. and it happened to be that that story that I just told about mm. when I got DSL. Okay. Like my friend came over with it. We set his laptop, or not his laptop. We set his desktop up in my kitchen, <laughs> and he was like, "Here, play. I, I have an EverQuest account. Play it." And uh, that's one of the reasons that I missed school one of the days. Mm. <laughs> mm. Yes, it is a very addictive type of game. It those is. those Warcraft games. Well, I mean, the, the MMOs. Yeah. Because uh, Ever, EverQuest was totally separate. Um, speaking of EverQuest, actually, the mm. composer on this game, Glenn Stafford, has done a lot. Of pretty much all of the <laughs> Blizzard things. Okay. Started out with Lost Vikings in 1993. Okay. Was, you know, Super NES game. Yep. Yeah. 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 Warcraft 2 Tides of Darkness, Beyond the Dark Portal, Starcraft, Diablo, Diablo 2, Warcraft 3, everything on here. And then also did audio director for EverQuest, some of the EverQuest expansions and EverQuest 2 expansions. Okay, okay. So, man, this this guy, definitely definitely a Blizzard alum. Yeah, yeah. But the, the EverQuest thing, I, I, I'm confused. I, but yeah, so... Yeah, I, 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 I dig the MIDI booming drums yes. here. <laughs> and I, I also really like... Right before the end of the track, before it loops, it's it's a little more like symphonic, like dun, dun, oh dun, yeah, there's dun, more dun, stuff dun, dun, in there. Yeah, there's yep. a little bit more going on, but uh, you know the the track overall was pretty good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that'll take us into our next bit. So the next game we are going to hear from is, I mean, these are all favorites of mine, but this is my favorite Final Fantasy. Final Fantasy IX on the PS One came out in two thousand. The track is Vama a la Flamenco, and it was composed by Nobuo Uematsu. <laughs>
Welcome back. You're listening to XVGM Radio, and that was Vamo a la Flamenco from Final Fantasy IX on the PS1. Came out in 2000 and composed by Nobuo Uematsu. Ole! Ole, <laughs> indeed. This one is is a lot of fun. This is actually probably, if, if, if you go through the entire track listing, this is probably the one that stands out as, what? Yeah. <laughs> as, as this far sounds, as my picks. sounds more like something that would be composed by... Yoko Shimomura, mm. you know, in like a, either I don't know. I got a very like Vega Street Fighter Two vibe. There's a reason for that. Yeah. Uh, so it's okay. It, it's called Vamo a la Flamenco because mm-hmm. it's written in the style of the flamenco. Yes. Uh, Nobuo wanted to do something, uh, something a little out of left field for this. Mm. Uh, it, it definitely fits in the in the place that that it is. Um, not that you go to Spain in this game at all, because <laughs> uh, this. So the, the the flamenco itself is is a traditional Spanish type of music. Right. Just to let people know, like that, the reason that, that it's named this is because he wanted to write a flamenco. Mm. A flamenco is composed of uh, some combination of the following items: singing, uh, guitar playing, dancing, uh, vocalizations or choral things, mm. uh, hand clapping, and finger snapping. Right, uh, right, right. Definitely uh, can can get the the hand clapping mm-hmm. in there. Absolutely. Um, the the guitar playing and. I mean, the dance, usually the dance it's part like a is Spanish more, guitar. Yeah, usually, exactly. Yeah, and yeah. this was definitely Spanish guitar. Yeah, but it was just—it's so much fun, and it's such a like—it feels like such a good Spanish piece mm-hmm. that like, who would have guessed this? This would have came out of a game. Like, yeah. if you just drop this, make somebody listen to this that has no idea about video games. Mm-hmm. They're like, oh, you know, this is—it's it, a really good song. Yeah, and yeah. Tell them it's from a video game. They're like, what's the game about? Bullfighting. <laughs> <laughs> so where's this fit into Final Fantasy IX? Like gameplay wise, like. So this song actually plays near the beginning of the game. The game itself opens up with a big sort of heist about to go down. There's this uh, troop of theater people that are actually also thieves. Some of the characters end up becoming a part of this troop. Mm -hmm. But the play that's being put on is a play called I Want to Be Your Canary. And (laughs) there is a, a part in this play where the, you know, the good guys are versus the bad guys. And so there's a sword fight between the character that you play as Zidane, mm-hmm. um, he the monkey boy. Yes, the monkey boy. Yes, um, he is playing you know, the, one of the good guys in the play, and he is having a sword fight with the you know the, the the villain. And it's very much like it's not a Spanish play or anything sure. like that. So it's not you know oh it fits because it's Spanish, but mm. the the staging uh, and the the. The, the sword play that goes on is very much like you would see in almost like a Don Quixote type thing. Right, right. Okay, okay. Huh, interesting. Yeah, not my, uh, you know, not my favorite Final Fantasy, mostly. I've never played it. I don't mind chibi-style characters in most stuff, but I did not like the way they did it in 9. Uh, I, no, I, and that, I couldn't get past it's, it. It's, it's, a very, it's a very particular art style, mm. and it, it's sort of a... Like an exit of form for where they were going, because I mean, you came from you know the two D eight bit world to the you know sixteen bit world that was mm. still two D, but Final Fantasy VI kind of threw in some not that it was Mode Seven or anything, but they, mm. they threw in some some three D stuff, and then you go to Final Fantasy VII where you start getting the the three D, and then eight went more realistic with it, and mm. then nine it looked a lot smoother, but they they went back to this cartoonish style. Yeah, that's I think what <clears throat> bugged me about it because in both seven and eight. Specifically, seven, they they did have the chibi style, but it was only when you were in certain parts of the game. Exactly. And then when you were like fighting, or if there was like a CG cutscene or or whatever, then it would change to a more realistic style, which I appreciated. And the regular art, like represented like more adult looking characters. Yes. Yes. And then Final Fantasy VIII, I loved all the character <laughs> designs in Final Fantasy VIII. You know, to go from that like super ultra realistic kind of anime style and then move back into a more cartoonish chibi style i think that if they i wouldn't have had a problem with it if they kept those visuals for the Mm in-game parts and then they changed it to be like more adult looking realistic characters for like the fmv yeah yeah Yeah, yeah. then i think it would be more fitting or more in my interest Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, yeah no that's that's fair i was never really big into the chibi super deformed stuff mm. um, I mean there's definitely some things that they did with chibi that I, I hated but mm. uh, at the time this game came out there were a number of like, chibi type things that I, that I was actually really into so the art style for the game like the fact that, that it was that and then it mm. stayed that throughout the entire game I was like oh that's really cool 
Uh, and the other the other reason that this game holds a special place in my heart is this is the first game I ever bought with my own money. Like I had okay. a job, I was earning money. Right, right. Um, I was I was in, near the end of high school and mm. like I bought this game and it mm. solidified it, it itself somehow. That's cool. Yeah. But no, overall, I mean the the story of the game was great. I really really did enjoy this game for a lot of different things they did. Mm -hmm. I mean they they did sort of a return to form for like the the, the story the actual story of the game. They brought the crystal back front and center, mm. and the the music itself was fantastic. The characters were interesting. So overall, I just could not get enough of this game. Yeah, from what I've seen about this game. The fans of Final Fantasy IX typically, not saying everybody, but typically <laughs> are people who started with the series at a much mm -hmm, mm -hmm. older age uh, where they were playing Final Fantasy I, II, III, you know, all the old, old ones. And they're the ones who this game was for. Yeah, no, and that, that's absolutely true. That yeah. was a, a lot of the advertisement for this game was, you know, um, you know, the, the crystal is back, or mm -hmm. you know, the, the, a lot of the advertisements talked about the return to form for this game. Right, right. Uh, and, and it's funny, the man who is the Final Fantasy series, uh, when asked what his favorite Final Fantasy was, this was this was his favorite. Sakaguchi, right? Yes, yes, yeah, that's the yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a Nobuo Uematsu track. It's, it's a great song. I love the flamenco style. I love yes. really, like, like Spanish kind of guitars like that. And not much to say about Nobuo Uematsu. I mean, he did Rad Racer. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> Um, also, <laughs> Cruise Chaser Blasty in okay. 1986. Okay. Blue Dragon Plus in 2009. Did right. For that. He did. Yes, yes. Oh, hey. Uh, the last story. I did not realize. Oh, yeah. He did composition for that. He did, yeah. Holy yeah, that's crap. on the Wii. That's, yeah, I, I have that. That's yeah. awesome. I, didn't, yeah. I never realized. Well, now you're going to go back home and play it. Yeah. Yeah. Norn 9, Var Commons, you know, 2015. Right. I'm sure we've all heard of these games. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> all right, let's move into our next track what do you got for us so next up we are going to hear a track off the ps2 uh, this is res came out in 2001 the track is called rock is sponge also <laughs> known as stage four the composer on this is jujuka jujuka <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
All right, put your glow sticks away. That was Rez on the PS2 that came out in 2001. The track is Rock is Sponge, also known as Stage 4 or Area 4, and it's by Jujuka. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Jujuka. Real quick, they are a uh, Japanese big beat project from Tokyo that was formed in the late 90s by Takeshi Isogai and Tsuyoshi Suzuki. Hmm. And just in case people don't know, big beat, uh, it's a genre of electronic music. Hmm. Uh, it uses heavy break beats and synthesizer generated loops and patterns, which you can very clearly hear in this song. Oh yeah, <laughs> definitely. Again, a, another game that I that I really like. I, I don't know why I keep saying that. I wouldn't pick these games and songs <laughs> <laughs> they weren't they weren't things that I liked. True. But no, I mean, it, so if if people haven't noticed, I mean, we 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 literally started with like the old system, like the, the Intellivision. We've been coming up through the years. Uh, they did a couple tracks from the NES, the SNES, Genesis, a couple uh, computer tracks, and then we went PS One, now it's PS Two. Very so, worldly yeah, no, selection of music. Just generally kind of going through the uh, the timeline mm -hmm. of, of the systems that I. That I owned or had had big so you, fun with. So you had this game? Yes. Okay. Uh, I, I I have multiple versions of this. Oh, game. Oh, do you? It came out in the Dreamcast originally, I yeah. believe, and then it came out in the PS2, and that's where this game got big. Yeah. I mean, the history of this game is, how it is kind goes. of funny. Well, it, th this game in particular, um, pe people laugh about the history of this game because it had a special feature on the PS2. <laughs> or I don't know if you're aware of this. I'm. I think I know where you're going with this. There, there was. I believe it was a USB. Uh, plug-in device, and I don't think the um, in, the English version came with us. I, I think no, this was a, a Japanese it was a Japanese exclusive. exclusive. It was called a trans vibrator, mm -hmm. and it was uh, it was powered by the USB, and it was meant to go like between your legs or like un under one of your legs, so that you could feel the beat in your body mm. uh, as the game was playing. And obviously, there uh, the, that went off the rails. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The music in this game was was quite fantastic. This, mm -hmm. is, this is my favorite level in the game. Okay. Uh, mostly because of the end boss. I forget if it's actually called this, but I always call it the running man. All of the bosses are made up of little pieces. Mm -hmm. um, the first one, it's like, like a big like, tentacle thing. But this one, all the little pieces turn into the form of a man running through the hallways and you're you're trying to like blast the pieces down. So it starts as a tentacle no, and the, then it turns into a man? The, no, the first boss is a tentacle. This, this oh. is the four, fourth level's boss is, okay. is, is a running man. Ah, uh, okay, okay. But yeah, uh, fu funny enough about that trans vibrator thing, when they redid this on the Xbox Live Arcade, the yeah. Xbox 360, it was Res HD, and there was there was an option called Trans Vibrator Mode. Oh, you could connect up to four <laughs> Xbox 360 controllers and yeah. have them all vibrate in, in time with okay. the game. Okay, <laughs> okay, okay, that's pretty funny. Yeah. So you have the the vibrating controller then? I mean, don't we all? Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I don't have so I don't have this for the PS2. Yeah. Um, I do have this on the Xbox Live Arcade, and I ended up buying the version that came out on the PS4. I still Res don't... Infinite or yes, whatever. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And I still don't have the PSVR. Oh. But this is the game that I would buy it for. Sure. I, I brought it over a friend's house. Our friend, our mutual friend Kevin, has yeah. the, the VR stuff. And uh, when he got it, I, I showed up at his house with his game. and was like, mm. can I play this? And he was like, yeah. sure, go ahead. Mm. And it was it was amazing. Like, this game itself, if, if you're not familiar with it, it's like a rail shooter. It's a musical rail shooter. Everything that you do and shoot um, it's makes... rhythm-based, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and it adds to the music. Mm -hmm. And you, you really only have so much control of what you're seeing at. For the most part, like, it's a classic rail shooter. The camera turns for you and whatnot. Right. The VR version is... Insane. Insane. Yeah. Because you are now the camera so anywhere you look sure. is worth looking so you have so much more control that's really cool but at the same time all this stuff is coming right at your face right 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 this game just like writes itself for jokes it does it yeah. does I mean from the from the very beginning <laughs> when, when I when I first heard about the, the PS2 add-on I was mm -hmm. like wow interesting game though I don't think this game got the respect it deserved on the Dreamcast and then no. it came over to the PS2 and everyone was like I love Res and it's like where were you when it came out on the Dreamcast? Well, it didn't have a vibrant in the Dreamcast. That's so. true. That's true. <laughs> All right. So, uh, that's Res. Okay, That is then. Res. That is my pick for my PS2 era. So, moving into the Xbox 360, uh, we are going to listen to a track from Dynasty Warriors Gundam 3. Ooh. The track is called Esperance Type 2. The game came out in 2011 and was composed by Shinichiro Nakamura, Masato Koike, and Miki Fuji.
Welcome back. That was Dynasty Warriors Gundam 3 on the Xbox 360, which came out in 2011. The track was called Esperance Type 2 and was composed by Shinichiro Nakamura, Masato Koike, and Miki Fuji. Mm-mm. Yeah. That's my kind of track right there. That was that was a great track. That actually, I'm not sure how familiar you are, you are with the Gundam series, but the opening to that really felt like um, something out of G Gundam. I was going to say, this sounds like something from Guilty Gear, not knowing anything about Dynasty oh, Warriors or Gundam. Too. Yeah. 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 This, this could totally be a, been a Guilty Gear track. So good. <laughs> Love it. Anything with symphonic elements, with soaring melodies, yes. electric guitar, <laughs> just gobble me up right there. <laughs> so good. Yeah, no, this one was a lot of fun, but the, so the part that I'm talking about is that, that opening, the ba 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 Yeah, yeah. I, that, that's kind of like, yeah, I, I'm assuming that, that's the... That's the very classic melody. anime style. Yes, mm. yes. Um, and, and that's, it fits right in with, like, the, the, the G Gundam style. That's the one that came out, I mean, technically it came out in, I think, the 80s or 90s, but it, it came mm. out in America, and, like, I think when we were in college, like, in the early 2000s, mm. it was the one that was... It was all about Gundam fights, like you know, right. Gundam Wing, which is all about this political intrigue, and all right, the right, other, right. all the other Gundam things are about like, these, these wars. So there was like an island, and it was it was all just like matchups, like the the Gundam from America versus the Gundam from Japan, hmm. and, and then there was, they, they had these fights. And there it was, was like, like Gundam the World Warrior, <laughs> sort of, yeah, yeah, like, like, yeah, like yeah. Street Fighter Gundam, right, right, exactly. But it, it had that like cheesy '80s vibe to it, which that opening kind of felt like. But this is Dynasty Warriors mixed with Gundam, right? Meaning like it's like a Gundam-based game. I don't know why they call it. Why didn't they call it Gundam Warriors? You know yeah, what I mean? That's a good question because yeah. uh, they, they have Samurai Warriors and they have Hyrule Warriors. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. But for whatever reason, yeah, it, it's it's a Dynasty Warriors game that's basically skinned as Gundams. Mm. Uh, like there there aren't really any human opponents because a Gundam would just crush a human. <laughs> I was gonna say that'd be really <laughs> hilarious if you're playing as a Gundam. Them and you're just destroying like old like Japanese Edo period. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> or, like, There'd be like no fight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's just like stomp. Dump, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's over. it. You win. Yeah. But yeah, so it's, it's like <laughs> swaths of like mobile suits, and then you get to pick uh, if you want to, you know, what Gundam you want to play as, and who you want your pilot to be. Hmm. It's very, I wouldn't call it complex, but it, it, it's a very in-depth game. Mm -hmm. And I've tried the Dynasty Warriors game, Dynasty Warriors and, and Samurai Warriors. Yeah. And for whatever reason, I was just no good at them. And then one day, one of my friends came home with uh, this this game in particular, Dynasty mm -hmm. Warriors Gundam 3. And I was like, oh, yeah, the Gundams are kind of cool. And, and he, he gives me control. I was like, hey, you know, check it out. And I just tore through it. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I don't, know, I don't know why it was easier. It, maybe the game itself is easier. It's always a good feeling when you could do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like I said, I tried Dynasty Warriors, and I was like, wow, this game is not for me. So yeah. I just avoided any of this stuff. It's hack and slash. But I think the difference is with Gundam, it's it's more probably something that you're more interested in a maybe, little bit more maybe. than the Edo period, you know? Yeah. So it's, you know... I like some of the aspects of Dynasty Warriors and Samurai Warriors, but it's a little too repetitive for me in most cases. I have to, like, kind of adore the characters. That's why I picked up the Berserk Musou game, and oh, I picked yeah, up yeah. Um, Hyrule Warriors when it came out. Yep. So Same. I like both of those. I own Samurai Warriors 3 on the Wii, and mm. I pretty much got it just because it has one of the characters from, like, Takamaru's Castle or whatever, like, the, that mm. that lost NES game that came out in the yeah, Famicom yeah. disc system or whatever. But. Takeshi's Castle? Uh, Takeshi. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. it's Takeshi's Castle. Haunted Castle or something like that. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But yeah, that is Dynasty Warriors Gundam. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the third entry. Right, right, right. So right. I, I, start, I started at this one, and then oh, okay. ev eventually I, w I went back for some of the other ones. Mm. I, I didn't really complete everything, but it was funny because up until this point, I'd really only enjoy like Gundam Wing, G Gundam, and a couple of the other like the, they're considered like alternate universes or side stories or whatever. Uh, and then playing through this game, I did sort of the same thing. Like you have, to, I have to be interested in the character plays. So right. I played, th played through with all of the all of the characters from the shows that I liked, mm -hmm. but in order to get through and get all the stuff in this game, you need to play through with a lot of the other characters. So I ended up getting sucked into Gundam because of this game. Okay. I ended up playing through Amuro's story from, from the original Gundam, and I was like, wow, there's some things that I don't get in here, now I want to see the show, mm. so I, I ended up getting all of Gundam. Oh, wow. <laughs> Jeez, that's a lot. Yeah, and it's this <laughs> game's fault. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. Yeah. But yeah, so we were talking about the, the the music and just like how cool it sounds. Yeah, that music was put together by a couple of people. So tell me about Shinichiro 
Nakamura. Yeah, so Mr. Nakamura mostly worked with Tecmo and I guess you could say Team Ninja on a lot mm. of stuff. First game was Distrega in 1998. Did sound editing on that. That's like a PS1 kind of like Smash Brothers brawling type game. It's oh. a really fun game. Crimson C2 did sound editing on that. As far as composition goes, Dynasty Warriors Gundam 2, Gundam 3, One Piece Pirate Warriors, which is, you know, basically One Piece and the Warriors games mixed yeah. together. <laughs> Ninja Gun 3 Razor's Edge did audio design on. Mostly doing like audio design and and really only doing composition on like either the One Piece games or or like the Dynasty Warriors games. So yeah. especially the Gundam game series of those. We also have Masato Koike started out in 2003 with Dynasty Warriors 3 Extreme Legends doing Extreme. sound design. Extreme! <laughs> but did some music composition in Dynasty Warriors 6 in 2008, Dynasty Warriors 7 in 2011, and... Hyrule Warriors in 2014. Yes, did yes. Audio, audio design. Did, yeah, did the music in 2014 and then came back in 2016 to do audio design for Hyrule Warriors Legends. Right, same game pretty much, just like maybe a few yeah. extra added I think that tracks. was for the DS. DS, the 3DS, right? yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yep, yep. So. Yeah. And then Miki Fuji, pretty much just, uh, again, Samurai Warriors, Ninja Gaiden 3, and Razor's Edge, which was the remastered version of Ninja Gaiden 3. Mm. Uh, One Piece Pirate Warriors and Dynasty Warriors Gundam 3. And a great soundtrack on Fist of the North Star Ken's Rage did sound editing Ooh, on that. Yeah, yeah. Great soundtrack on that game. So, good stuff. I approve all around. All the music, pretty much, you know, this symphonic, yes. heavy metal awesomeness. So... I think you're really gonna like the next track then fully on board let's do it what's <laughs> our what's our last track of justin's picks so we are gonna go out in the era of the ps4 with transformers devastation this came out on the ps4 in 2015 the track is called Soundwave, and it was composed by satoshi igarashi he was the lead composer on this but also tetsuya shibata and jun okubo Thank you. 
All right, going out with a bang, that was Transformers Devastation on the PlayStation 4 in 2015. That was the release date, and that was Soundwave by Satoshi Igarashi, who was the lead composer, Tetsuya Shibata, and Jun Okubo. What a great track. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> the just killer metal guitars, mm. and then combined with all of the, like, Dubsteppiness. Yeah, I was gonna say they're, they're not explicitly dubstep sounds, but they are very much associated with that Whoa. genre these days. So. There are wubs and dubs. Oh. <laughs> In my mind, this is a metal dubstep that, track. That, that's fair. I mean, I'll I'll, I'll allow it. <laughs> but oh man, just it's so my I have to pick my face up off the floor because it melted yep. off my my skull. <laughs> I really dig that chugginess in the beginning, but. Mm. I'll tell you, the later part of the track was my favorite. Like towards the end? Or? Yeah, where it's just like spiraling out of control, just tons <laughs> of like wailing, and a little bit more melodic too, which is my, more my preference. I, I love heavy stuff, but I love when heavy stuff becomes melodic stuff, yeah. so yeah. The dubsteppiness, I don't know, I don't dislike dubstep, I do like parts of dubstep. I don't know if it was the right fit for this track, but I don't know. If you haven't played this game and you were a fan of old Transformers, mm. I, I strongly urge you to either pick it up or borrow it from a friend and, and give it a shot because it, if, you, if you liked Gen 1 Transformers, mm. that's what this game is. Awesome. Um, it like it has the look, the cell shaded. Like mm -hmm. it looks, it looks like the cartoons we used to watch. Yeah. But cleaner. That's cool. Um, it's got all the sounds. It's I need got, to pick this up. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to trying to think how to describe it because when I when I first saw it, I thought it was going to end up being like. Transformers Warriors. Okay. Okay. Uh, and it, it so it's like an action hack and slash yeah, kind yeah, of game. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. But uh, it's like you know you start off as Optimus Prime, and of course Megatron is there causing trouble, and then this same voice actors oh, from yeah. the original for, for really Welker and uh, and Peter Cullen. That's amazing. Yeah, they they got all of the voices back that they could. That's yeah. I know they couldn't get Starscream back because Starscream's voice actor passed away. Right. Exactly. Like back in like the late eighties, early nineties. I'll tell you the person who does Starscream in the game. Mm -hmm. If you hadn't told me that his that his voice actors had died, yeah. I would have thought it was the same guy. Okay, okay. Either way, it's just, it's just a lot of fun. Gen 1 was my favorite for the Transformers. I also used to watch Beast Wars. Did you used to watch yes, that? Beast yeah. Wars and Beast Machines. Yep, yep, yep. I never watched Beast Machines. I just watched Beast Wars. Yeah, Beast Machines was... I don't know. I don't know if I would say it was better. Um, mm. It looked a little different, uh, yeah. and it connected the story of Beast Wars back to the whole original. Transformers right, right, lot, right. Uh, yeah, a lot more. Yeah, I was more of a He-Man kid growing up, but oh, yeah, I, yeah. I did really like the first generation Transformers, and Soundwave has always been my favorite, so good eye on that one. <laughs> Soundwave also happens to be one of my good friends' favorite as well. Oh, yeah. As far as, far as all of the, the Decepticons go, mm -hmm. I think he's probably my favorite, too. Like mm -hmm. I love the, the modulated voice, just yeah. like the roboticness of, of everything. It's funny because the you, we mentioned Frank Welker, mm -hmm. Frank Welker also voiced Dr. Claw from mm -hmm. Inspector Gadget. And Soundwave's voice, because he also does Soundwave's voice. Right. Soundwave's voice unmodulated is Dr. Claw. Just that, it's that literally deep, that, deep you know, voice. I'll get you next time, Gadget. Oh my god. It's literally <laughs> that, but but they put a vocoder effect on it. So it's like, I'll get you next time, Gadget. You know, yeah. like, I can't huh. do it because my voice is shot, but. Well, you're also not a robot. So. Right, that's true. Or am I? <laughs> But yeah, no, that I actually, I did not know that. Uh, yeah, that's that's really cool. Mm -hmm. So I love this track, and I'm gonna have to check out this game because it's really cool. So the composers on this one. Yeah, so Satoshi Igarashi has a very short list. Mm. The musical composition for Bayonetta 2 in 2014 and Transformers Devastation, and the other two entries here are Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles: Mutants in Manhattan in 2016 and Near Automata in 2017. Both of those are musical implementation. Right, so this is a Platinum Games developed game. Yes, Platinum yes, Games yes. did Near Automata and you know they did all those games that you talked about, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles yeah, yeah. game. So. Well, that, that makes sense. Yep, yep, yep. So that adds up. And then Tetsuya Shibata worked on Marvel vs. Capcom 2. Good game. Power Stone 2 uh, did the Dreamcast online version of Vampire Chronicle, which is also known as Darkstalkers. Oh, Darkstalkers, yes, yes. I think it was the third one. And was the sub-music composer for Darkstalkers 3. Pretty much started off as a Capcom employee 
and then ended up getting hired on to, you know, did, did like, you know, some more stuff with Capcom, like Monster Hunter, Devil May Cry, pretty much all the soundtracks for the Devil May Cry games, up to the fourth one, and then ended up leaving to do work on Smash Brothers for the Wii U and the 3DS, hmm. and Half Minute Hero, the second coming, which I think is the sequel to yes. Half Minute Hero. The first game is a lot of fun and a great, great soundtrack, so... Hmm. Good stuff. And then ended with Transformers Devastation in 2015. And then finally, Jun Okubo, uh, the only game credit that they have is a musical, musical composition on Transformers Devastation. Right, right, right. Yeah, so that brings us to an end on Justin's episode. <laughs> Justin's musical picks 2018. Yeah, I hope, uh, hope people uh, learned a bit about me here. Yeah. Uh, I hope that what they learned was good stuff and not, you know, that my musical tastes are, tar- are terrible. No, no. But now, uh, I mean, obviously there, I think there's something in here for, for everyone. We, we have we have some fans that aren't really a fan of, like, the the, the orchestral or the screaming sure. really, um, and for and we have a, a ton of good uh, chip stuff in the beginning. Mm-hmm. And for those who like the more orchestral or live music type stuff, yeah, um, or like properly played, not composed on a. <laughs> You're really struggling. Computer. I, with this. I, I, I don't know the words. I can't <laughs> think of the words. A real guitar. Mm. Um, but yeah, so we, we, we I had a little bit of something for everybody. Yeah, absolutely. So if I had to pick a favorite track, <laughs> I'm gonna go with that Dynasty Warriors Gundam Three track. Really? Yeah, I love that track. It's really good. I mean, I know you were probably thinking, oh, he's going to pick the Transformers track. I love that Transformers track, too, but I really, really love the Dynasty Warriors track. That's fair. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean... Well, they're all your picks, I was going to say, like, this is officially the hardest episode for me to pick tracks from. (laughs) Uh, But I think for mostly nostalgia and a little bit of that wedding stuff I talked about, I'm Mm going to go with the Final Fantasy opening theme. Yeah, I can understand that, because it's especially got some sentimental aspects yeah. from it. So that's pretty cool. All right. Well, we want to thank everybody for tuning in to this episode. You can let us know what you thought of it on facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash XVGM radio, where you can comment on the episode, find it in either the announcements or find it somewhere on the page or search for it on that Facebook group. It's free admission. Anybody can join, and we talk about video games and video game music, so hop on in. Uh, if you would like to make any contributions to us, you can contribute to our Patreon at patreon.com slash xvgmradio, and to that end, we would like to say a, a quick thank you to all of our Patreon. So we have Alex V. Messenger, Cameron Worma, Chris Murray, Chris Myers, Scott McElhone, and the Autistic Gamer 89 Yeah, so thank you all so much for choosing to donate to our podcast. We are very, very close to being able to get some new equipment to record with very, very soon. So hopefully the show will sound even crisper and cleaner and sweeter. And we'll be able to do one of those Patreon live shows shows, Yes, yes, that we've been talking about doing. So stay tuned for that. We have social media accounts. You can check us out on Twitter and Instagram. Our handle is at xvgm radio you could also email us at xvgm radio at gmail.com and let us know what you thought of the show let us know where we can improve where you think that we could go with the show if you have a suggestion for a track that you really like just really anything you can email us and let us know what your favorite food is right now (laughs) it's true so you could also check us out on itunes we really appreciate you guys Jumping on there and leaving us a quick review, what you think of the show, and also just give us a rating. Helps get us noted down so that way they will be able to kind of broadcast our signal when you search for VGM. Because right now they don't. Yeah, it it helps more people find us. Yeah, absolutely. The more people that find us, the more people that might find something they like. Yep, and if you do have iTunes and you use iTunes, subscribe so that way you are getting the episodes on time. Yeah. Yeah. So... What we have coming up is a composer interview, and we are going to be speaking with Jeff Ball, who has composed game soundtracks like Tiny Barbarian DX. Uh, We are going to be talking to him about one game and one game only, and that is Time Spinner. It's a recently released Metroidvania game. The music is incredible. It's a great, great soundtrack, and the game is phenomenal, too. We're going to talk about all of that in two weeks, and... For Metroidvania fans or fans of games like Symphony of the Night, you are in for a treat. If you like the PlayStation 1 era music or like the Super Nintendo like role-playing game type music, Mm -hmm. you're going to go bonkers for this stuff. 
Yeah, the, the, the game itself was really fun, mm -hmm. and whew, the music was very, very nice. Yes, yeah. So stay tuned in two weeks. Otherwise, this is Justin and Mike signing off for XVGM Radio. Peace out. It started out, and I thought that it was going to roll into that song from Homestar Runner. Oh, the, she, the system was, is down. Yeah, the system is down. It was really going in that direction. System. System. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to get sued by the brother chaps for playing that now. But we yeah. told you you could turn the vibrator on and off. <laughs> Not through a vibrator Not through rave. light switch vibrating raves. Jeez. The cheat is horny. Uh. <laughs> oh, oh man. Okay, so, so yeah. Let's so, let's move into the next track before yes. we get rated R <laughs> on this.